Just a, a quick uh, overview of what Trovagene is. Trovagene is a molecular diagnostic company. Uh, we, have, uh, we are really uh, focused in the cell-free uh, diagnostic space. Uh, we have significant technology around uh, highly quantitative and, and sensitive assays in, with circulating tumor DNA, both in uh, urine and plasma, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Um, we are a CLIA lab, and we are uh, NASDAQ listed. I think a lot of you in the audience already know about circulating tumor DNA, and you've seen many slides or, or cartoons really showing about how you can get circulating tumor DNA from plasma. And the reason I put this up here was just to show you that really you could also do it in urine. And I'm going to show you five different clinical studies very quickly that really demonstrate the, uh, really the use of either urine, urine or plasma in, in several different clinical utility vignettes. Now, I think we all know also that circulating tumor DNA has really exploded because of the fact that it allows us to capture the inner tumor heterogeneity, it's non-invasive, and being able to have the ability to do this or measure this either in plasma or urine allows the clinician a greater amount of flexibility uh, with, uh, with, with given whatever clinical uh, utility is or, what, or what's going on with that patient. Now, um, not to overuse the word clinical utility, which is overused as we know today, but really when you start to think about it in circulating tumor DNA, there really are, uh, I think, I would propose really two major areas where, where there's this, this type of technology can really make a difference. First of all is in a very the simple case of detection of the mutation. And really, it's where a tissue biopsy is either unavailable or there's patient morbidity issues. And, and I'm going to show the first uh, study, show you a little bit about that and how really this can be used in even these kinds of what we consider to be simplistic approaches, but circulating tumor DNA can make a profound effect in those areas. The other area that is talked about a lot is monitoring. I'll show you some of that as well. This is really, of course, emerging with looking at not only using circulating tumor DNA as a tumor load surrogate, but also the emergence of resistant mutations and also the really the more and more the use of drug holidays within the clinical sequencing uh, of, of a patient. Now, Trovagene is really made up of really four major pillars of the platform. First of all is really because in plasma, to get pl circulating tumor from DNA plasma, it's, you can really basically buy a kit off the shelf. But in order to get uh, DNA enriched for systemic DNA, that is to say DNA in the urine that comes from the circulation, uh, we were able to, to, we really went after that, um, actually what uh, was talked earlier, Dennis Lowe talked about the size, we really enriched for for basically isolating DNA from urine that is very short. As we heard earlier today, uh, plasma circulating tumor DNA or, or cell-free DNA is around 145 base pairs. And in urine, it's about 75 to 100 base pairs. So it's a little bit shorter. And so what we've done is we've built our assays to, for them to be compatible both in urine and plasma. And that requires us to use very short amplicons uh, to be able to have that uh, flexibility and compatibility of these assays. Uh, we also have a mutant enrichment process or, or methodology that allows us to really suppress the wild type, and that's really shown in the next slide, where if, uh, I th one of the big challenges, as we all know, in detection of fragments that have mutations on them in, in circulating uh, DNA is that you, you have a sea of wild type DNA. And so here I just show in a cartoon uh, the high level of the fact that what we do is we, in essence, block for, uh, we block wild type uh, amplification or wild type suppression uh, to be able to then have, be able to see these mutations much more readily. The, we are platform agnostic. Um, I will show some examples of droplet digital T, uh, PCR, but we have really moved to the NGS platform. And uh, we find that right now we are using the MySeq uh, Illumina platform. Works very well for uh, allowing us to then make these calls and to monitor these patients. And the fourth thing is really quantitation. Uh, if really, uh, if you're going to get into this and be able to not only detect a mutation or a genetic alteration, 
but to monitor that over time for a patient, one has to have a quantitative way of measuring uh, the changes in that patient. So one of the things to keep in mind is that in plasma, uh, you only have a certain amount of, of circulating tumor DNA. In urine, actually, you do have actually quite a bit more DNA to work with. This can be important uh, when, when you're trying to be able to find very, very uh, uh, rare uh, uh, detection of very rare mutations. And so that's one of the advantages that we do see with urine. I think that uh, for quantitation, uh, like I said earlier, one needs to have a robust methodology that allows you to deal with these highly fragmented and degraded uh, pieces of DNA, and one needs to have, uh, be able to uh, track these changes longitudinally. Urine and plasma, in essence, uh, depends really on the clinical context of, of what, what this test is being used for or how it integrates with, with patient care. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, first one is one that was recently published uh, in our collaboration with uh, Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson. And this was really a prospective blinded study that we did with them on a, an orphan disease. It's, it's a histiocytic disorders, which was thought to be an inflammatory disease, but then very quickly, uh, because it was found that 50% that of these patients had a V600D BRAF mutation, uh, it started to really change the way that these patients were going to be treated. It's a erdheim chester and uh, the Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Uh, the histiocytic, uh, the other thing about this is that patients had been shown that patients who did harbor the V600D BRAF, they also had dramatic responses to BRAF inhibitors. But fundamentally, the problem here, the clinical, clinical problem, was that it's very difficult to get a biopsy from these patients to be able to determine the status of their V600D. So this is really where we came in and really tried to see if we could use a non-invasive test to re replace the tissue biopsy in this particular patient, these particular patients. The study design was really to look at concordance of between uh, the tissue, plasma, and urine and then to look longitudinally over time with these patients as well to see if, if the amount of v 600 e that was quantitated in the urine really uh, correlated with radiographic response. So really, they, really to, the most important thing here from a clinical utility point of view was the fact that using uh, urine ctDNA BRAF assay, we were able to call all 30 patients, 100% of them of either having a V600E or wild type. And then if you look to the right, you can see that in the, with the urine CT DNA, we had 30 patients uh, with a pre-specified cut point for or detected, non-detected. Uh, we were able to show 100% concordance between tissue and urine and plasma for those patients who were treatment naive. Uh, that is to say they had not received a BRAF inhibitor. I think the most important thing from this study uh, that from a utility point of view is really the fact that we were able to make the call on whether or not the patient had, and we really were a viable alternative to a tissue biopsy. If you look over time, we followed these patients. This was blinded. We would send back the data to Sloan Kettering. You can see on the left-hand side that there was really an association of a drop in the amount of detectable BRAF fragments in the urine and radiographic response in these patients to a BRAF inhibitor. Uh, also, on the right-hand side, you can see another example of that where the patient was really had a very high amount of BRAF in the urine, which then went dramatically down and was associated with uh, less tumor load, as you can see here. And then when they were taken off the BRAF inhibitor, it then went back up, uh, the amount of BRAF went up as well. I think another interesting thing that we found was that in one patient, they were receiving an anti-inflammatory uh, IL-1 antagonist. Uh, this was at MD Anderson. They, they actually did respond to it using the BRAF assay. You were able to actually measure something, uh, basically measure the tumor load of the patient. Uh, the patient was taken off of that because of toxicity, and within one week, the amount of BRAF detected went up dramatically. 
And then once we were put back onto a BRAF inhibitor, it went back down. So really showing you that uh, non-invasively be able to track these patients and responsiveness to therapy, not necessarily the BRAF inhibitor, but anything that really uh, would be affecting tumor load. In another example, uh, in, in colorectal cancer, we did a pilot study with a group from the Czech Republic. They had, they had, cap, they had uh, retrospectively stored plasma and urine uh, within those samples, and we were able to show that we had a high concordance between the plasma tissue and the urine in these, in these patients. But more interestingly than that was the fact that this study was a study where they were really looking for curative, tent, curative intent or palliative intent. This is stage four colorectal cancer, where, as you know, 50% of those patients metastasized to the liver, and so either they were doing surgery for cure or the surgery for palliative for those patients. And what you can see on the left-hand side is that in a patient that they went for curative intent, uh, they were removed liver mets as well as the part of the colon. The patients had high amount of of, this is, we're looking here at KRAS, uh, and both, uh, you'll notice right away that um, we tracked both urine and uh, a plasma, and we got very similar results from both of those, showing that over time in this particular patient on the left, that they had curative intent, and this patient still is living today, and that they had no detectable KRAS mutation over, uh, as they went after surgery. This patient uh, continued to increase the amount of KRAS mutation load or tumor load over time in the patient uh, deceased. But also from this, you can see that, that you can really be able to track these things both in urine and plasma, and they give very similar results. Another example was where we were looking in pancreatic cancer. We're very interested in, uh, in we had a very large uh, cohort that we're studying with the group at University of Copenhagen. And what I'll say here is we're looking at both the uh, pre and post uh, for pancreatic cancer, as well as in, uh, in the baseline, looking at the baseline of patients that are non-resectable. Uh, one of the interesting things about this, which, which probably doesn't come as a surprise to somebody in the audience, is that when a patient, 80% of pancreatic cancer patients are non-resectable, unfortunately, but the amount at that baseline in the plasma, the amount of copies of KRAS were directly correlated with overall survival of those patients. So if you had a high amount of KRAS, those patients had a much uh, shorter survival. What was, what was interesting, and we are now starting to look at also the, the stage one, two resectable patients to see how much we can detect in those prior to surgery. One of the things that was kind of interesting about this study, though, was that not only was there a significant difference based on the number of copies, so when we quantitated that we had a direct correlation with uh, statistically significant differences in, in survival, but also what we found on the left-hand side is that if you had less than six copies of, of KRAS, those patients, they lived the longest by far, but they also did not really increase the amount of their KRAS mutation uh, over time. This may suggest that I've got one minute. Okay. <laughs> Let me just really go through the rest of this very quickly. <laughs> So this is another example. Um, another example is looking at uh, metastatic cancer patients, all comers, and asking the fundamental question, does the amount of BRAF, uh, when it goes up or down, is it, does it correlate with clinical outcome? And the answer is yes. Very dramatic differences if it goes up or down on, on, on the, basically the progression-free survival. And also percent of tumor change based on RESIS 1.1. You can see the examples here. Uh, uh, really showing really either going up or down that's sort of highly correlated with clinical outcome. That, now, in, in non-small non cell cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, this is a really the, one of the huge opportunities for cell, circulating tumor DNA. All I can say to you here is that we know just going through a stage four patient, really the initial biopsy, then the monitoring when they're on allotinib, and then now the T790 inhibitors that are coming by Q3 of this year, and you can see that there's all uses of places where circulating tumor DNA can be very useful from the very simple, simplistic point of view of just when they cannot get a biopsy, 20 to 30% of patients that are stage four and treatment naive, really you cannot, a biopsy is very difficult to get or is not received. 
We know that studies have been shown that there is a massive uh, cost to getting biopsies from lung cancer. This was just something that was reported uh, in a recent meeting. And it's really, average biopsy cost is around $14,000 when you, when you start to add up what, not only if they have the uh, normal biopsies like uh, 8,000, but then when you have all the adverse effects, it actually increases with an average of 14. So this is a massive amount of burden, healthcare burden, that circulating tumor DNA can really drive these costs down significantly. And I won't go into it. We've just started a huge blinded study here in this area. And some of the, but some of our pilot studies are showing that we have 100% concordance in urine for T790M uh, in some of these patients who are progressing with allotinib. Anyway, what I'd like to say in summary is that I hope that I've shown you, um, now I haven't really talked about the technology so much, I really wanted to talk more about the different clinical utilities and where we're really driving some of these, uh, trying to address some of these very simple uh, questions that we think would be, that are significant in circulating tumor DNA, particularly in urine, uh, and how those can be used uh, in really patient care today. And um, I appreciate your attention.